<laughs> All right. Hey guys, thank you guys for joining me today. This is going to be episode 7 of an Old Testament three-piece, guys. We're going to be having some stories about um, Jacob, and we're going to be looking at some stories about Joseph. So, hope you guys are ready for that. Again, forgive me for whatever this crazy hair of mine is doing. I need a haircut so bad, guys. <laughs> <laughs> it's been so busy, I have not had time to be able to get it done, so I apologize for the raccoon that I have residing on top of my head at this point. But yeah, so we're going to be looking at some stories about Jacob and Joseph. Let's get into some prayer. I love y'all so much. Thank you for being a part of my walk of faith. Thank you for allowing me to be a part of your walk of faith, hopefully. Um, I always love to hear from you guys in the comment section. If you're new here, my name is Rex. This is a channel that came out of my salvation. It came out of my rebirth. Um, I was a heroin addict and a methamphetamine addict for over two decades. I cried out to Jesus Christ one morning so totally broken almost five years ago. And brothers and sisters, he... He, he met me in my need. He met me in my brokenness. He met me in my, my sin and my filth and my, my awful way of living. And um, ever since that day, it has been a constant blessing. I am still coming to terms, almost half a decade later, guys, and um, I'm still coming to terms daily with the how, 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 how much... I've been changed, how much I've been transformed, how much I've been risen to new life, right? Because I know this life that I'm living, it ain't, it ain't got nothing in common with the life I used to live. And, and the only thing I did different in the interim was Jesus Christ. That's the change that was made. Um, let's pray, guys. Heavenly Father, we want to come before you today, Lord grateful, thankful, appreciative, Lord. We, we want to take a minute, Father God. We want to praise you for who you are. You, you are the great, almighty, you are the ancient of days, you are the rose of Sharon, you are the, you, you are the rock of ages, Lord. You are our everything. You've created us, and more than that, Lord, more than that, you sustain us moment to moment, second to second, you sustain us. You provide for us a, a, a level of faith, you allow for our hearts to be made soft and fleshy. You allow for our, our eyes to be opened spiritually, Lord. I want to thank you, Lord, for being the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the God of the covenant, the unchanging God, the unwavering God, the pure God, the holy God, the righteous God, our God, Elohim, the Most High, Jehovah Nisi, our Prince of Peace. Jehovah Jireh, our provider, Lord. You are our provider. You are our provision and you are more than enough. You are more than enough. I want to ask that this video today, Lord, that it, that it feed us, that it sparks something within us to take these stories, these beautiful Bible stories so lovingly condensed for us, Lord, by, by Elsie Egermeyer, and that we're able to, to have them be a spark for our studies, have them be a spark for our own personal time in the Bible. I would also ask that this video be able to catch the eye, the ear, the attention of anyone out there still lost to sin, anyone out there not yet at the foot of the cross, anyone out there being misled by their own dark and deceitful hearts, by their own twisted tongues, by the lies of the world, by, by the secular foolishness that is promulgated and promulgated upon people by the enemy and those who do the enemy's work knowingly and unknowingly, as I did for so long, Lord. I want to pray for a hedge of protection around the lives of and a blood covering over the hearts and over the minds of children and the infirm and anyone unable to do so for themselves. Lord, guide us, lead us, protect us, help us to be your bright and shining city on a hill. Push us deeper into your arms, Lord. Allow our faith to blossom, Father God. Allow our faith to blossom, Father God. Help me to... Help me to properly share what it is that you've done in my life, Lord, with others. 
to, to be a righteous display of the gospel and its power at work. Pray all of this in the mighty, loving, righteous, and perfect name of your Son and our Savior, my Savior, Lord Jesus Christ. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen, guys. So, if you're new here, <clears throat> get a drink. I was out doing the landscaping work for a couple hours, and man, oh man, I'm choked up. We're going to be pulling these from Eggermeyer's Bible Storybook. This is written by Elsie Eggermeyer. She was a wonderful woman. This was published in the early 1920s. She edited it once in 1947, and since the 1920s, she has sold upwards of 4 million copies of this. So here's the idea, guys. I'm going to read you three different Bible stories. At the beginning of each one, I'm going to tell you the title of the Bible story, and then we're going to give you the exact scripture that it is based off of. And the idea is, if, if these stories touch you, if they speak to you, if the Holy Spirit leads you, please... Dig into the scriptures that these are based on. It gives you a chance on your own time and at your own speed to get to know your Bible better, to get to know where the books are at, to get to know where these stories are at, to just get to know your way around the beautiful love letter to humanity that is the Holy Bible. All right, guys, story number one. <clears throat> How Jacob's favorite son became a slave. Genesis 37. Among Jacob's twelve sons was one whom he loved better than the others. That one was Joseph, the eleventh son born in his household, and the eldest son of Rachel, his beloved wife. Joseph was a good boy indeed, just the kind of boy that a father can trust to do what's right. Sad to say, his elder brothers were not so careful always to do right, and their wrongdoing, in fact, brought much pain to Jacob's heart. Because Jacob loved Joseph so Tenderly, his brothers became envious of him. And when Jacob made a wonderful coat of many colors and gave it to his son Joseph, the older sons, they allowed, they, they permitted this bitter feeling of hatred to twist up within them and to creep into their wicked hearts. They, they hated Joseph. One day while he was in the field with four of them, he saw their evil conduct and on his return home, he told his father how wrongly they had behaved. Now by doing this, he increased the bitter feeling that was growing against him in his brother's hearts. For wicked people are always angered when someone exposes their wickedness. Joseph's brothers would no longer speak kindly to him. I'm reminded how, you know, everything that is done in the dark will be brought into the light in time. That which is hidden will always come to be revealed. By the mighty and true hand of God. Let's move on, guys. Joseph was now about 17 years old. One night, he had had a very strange dream. He told his brothers about it. We were together in the field binding sheaves. He said, and my sheath stood upright while yours bowed down around it. Do you think you are someday going to rule over us? The brothers asked in angry voices, and <laughs> they hated him even more now than they did before. Soon Joseph dreamed again, a dream more strange than the other one had been. This time he saw the sun, and he saw the moon, and eleven stars bowing down before him. If such a dream had any meaning at all, how could it mean anything else than that he should someday become a ruler before whom his relatives should bow themselves? Joseph wondered about the dream, and he told it to his father and brothers. His father was displeased because he thought it would be wrong for a man to bow down before his son. That would seem to make Joseph greater, better, and wiser than he. Still, he wondered what such a dream could mean, and he thought much about the matter. Now, Jacob and his family were living at Hebron, where Abraham had lived so long ago with his many servants and flocks and herds. You know what, guys? Let's stop right there. I just realized something. I did not tell you what this is based on. This story is based on Genesis 37. Genesis chapter 37, all right? Joseph started out alone on his long journey of 50 miles to Shechem. 
I'm sorry, I started in the wrong place, guys. Let's go back. Now Jacob and his family were living in Hebron, where Abram had lived so long ago with his many servants and flocks. And Jacob's flocks were so large that they could not find enough pasture nearby at all seasons, and sometimes they had to be taken far from home to find grass and water. The time came again when it was necessary to find pasture elsewhere. So Jacob sent his ten eldest sons to Shechem with the cattle and the sheep. After they had been away from home for some weeks, Jacob sent Joseph on an errand to learn whether or not the young men were getting on well with their work. Joseph started out alone on his long journey of 50 miles to Shechem. When he came to the place, he could not find his brothers nor their flocks. He did not know where to go in search of them. Soon, a man who lived in a town nearby met him and told him that in fact his brothers had gone to Dothan to find better pasture. Joseph then journeyed on over the hills and across the valleys to Dothan, which was 15 miles further from Hebron, and it was there that he saw the flocks feeding on the great green grass long before he arrived at the place. Now when the brothers saw a young man coming across the fields, clad in a beautifully colored cloak, coat, they said at once to each other, huh, Here comes the dreamer. You know what? Let us kill him. And we shall see what will become of his dreams. The eldest brother, Reuben, felt more kindly toward Joseph and wished to save his life. But he feared the others would not listen if he should tell them not to harm Joseph. So he said, let us not kill him. Only throw him down into this pit and leave him alone to die. The others quickly agreed to do as Reuben said, and when Joseph approached, they seized him. They tore off his beautiful coat and roughly... They abused him and put him into the deep pit. Then they sat down on the ground and they ate their lunch, paying no heed to his pitiful cries. Now Reuben did not intend to leave Joseph alone to die. He planned to come back as soon as the others should go away and to rescue his young brother from such a sad death. But it was not going to be Reuben, after all, who should draw Joseph from the pit. While the brothers were eating their lunch, Reuben went to another part of the field, and during his absence, a company of traveling merchants came riding by on camels. Some of these travelers were called Ishmaelites, because they were descendants of Ishmael, and they were going to Egypt to sell rich spices and perfumed gum, which had been gathered from trees in other countries. Now, thought Judah, another of Joseph's elder brothers, here is an opportunity to make some money, and to get rid of our brother without letting him die. So calling his brothers, he said it would be better to sell Joseph to these merchants than to leave him to die in the pit, for even though we despise him, I mean, he is our brother. The others were quite willing to sell Joseph, so they drew him out of the pit, and soon he saw himself being exchanged to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver. Poor Joseph. This was a sad time for him. Now he knew that he should be taken far away by rough strangers who had become his masters. Now he was sold. All his pleading and all his tears did not soften the hearts of his wicked brothers who greedily divided the money among themselves and supposed that they were forever rid of him. Perhaps they did not even watch the caravan as it moved slowly away toward the south and disappeared from view behind the green-clad hills. After the Ishmaelites passed on, and the brothers too went away to different parts of the field, Reuben came hurrying back to the pit. Stooping down, he called out to Joseph, but no answer came from the dark hole. Again and again he called, and again, thinking perhaps that Joseph had fallen asleep, but the silence remained unbroken. Joseph did not reply. It was then, after a while, that Reuben knew that his brother was not there. What should he do? Now he forgot he had been afraid to let his brothers know that he had intended all the while to rescue Joseph from their hands. He forgot everything, except for the fact that Joseph had disappeared. He believed some dreadful, awful thing had happened to the poor boy. Perhaps a wild beast had devoured him tearing his clothes as people did when they were in deep trouble. He returned to his brothers and he said, The child is gone! What shall I do? Being the eldest son, he felt that he should have taken better care of his brother. Now, 
Next came the question of how they should account to their father for the disappearance of his favorite son. Finally, they decided to dip Joseph's coat in blood, killing a young kid for this purpose, and take the blood-stained garment back to their father, telling him that they had found it in that condition. We see that they were planning to use a wicked lie to cover up their wicked deeds. Jacob was alarmed when his sons returned without Joseph when he saw the blood-dyed coat. He knew it was the very one that he had made for the lost boy, and he believed at once that wild animals had torn Joseph in pieces. And so he, tearing his own garments apart and dressing himself in rough sack cloth, he sat down and mourned bitterly for many days, refusing to even be comforted. Our second story, guys, Joseph, a prisoner in Egypt. Again, if you hear this story, if it speaks to you, if it touches you, check out these scriptures it's based on. Genesis chapter 37, verse 36, all the way through to Genesis 40, 23. So Genesis 37, 36, through to 40, 23. Thank you guys for letting me share with you. At the end of their long, dusty journey, the Ishmaelites arrived with Joseph in Egypt. Here, Joseph found himself surrounded by a dark-skinned people who spoke a different language from his own. And here he saw large cities, wonderful temples for idol worship, mighty pyramids, and the, the great river Nile. How strange all these things must have seemed to this boy who had always lived in tents. The Ishmaelites took Joseph to the city where the king of Egypt lived, and there they sold him to an officer within the king's army. Joseph could never forget how terror-stricken he had felt when his own brothers sold him as a slave, but he was a sensible lad, and when he realized that he was indeed a slave, he decided that he would try to be obedient to his master. And God did not forget him, nor the wonderful dreams he had given to Joseph when he was yet at home. God was now preparing Joseph for the time when those dreams should come true. Although Joseph could not understand God's plan, yet he trusted fully in God to help him do right. The Egyptian officer who bought Joseph was named Potiphar. He was a very rich man and had many other servants. Joseph soon learned the speech of the Egyptians, and because he showed a cheerful, obedient spirit, Potiphar took special notice of him. He saw that Joseph was always honest and that he had a good understanding of business affairs. After a while, he gave all the oversight of his household and his riches into Joseph's care. And for Joseph's sake, God blessed the Egyptian officer with greater riches. For several years, Joseph remained in Potiphar's house, a slave in name only, for in reality, he was the ruler over his fellow slaves and the caretaker of his master's wealth. Then there came a sudden change. Potiphar's wife was not a good woman, and she often tried to persuade Joseph to do wickedly. Because he would not, she finally became angry with him and accused him falsely to her husband. Potiphar believed the lie that she told, and to punish Joseph, he thrust the noble young man into the king's prison. How cruel this was. Perhaps Joseph wondered why he must suffer so often because of the sins of other people. To be a slave had seemed bad enough. To be thrust into prison while doing what was right was even worse. No doubt Joseph suffered much due to this wicked and unjust act. But Joseph was not the kind of person to fret and pout because of trouble. Let's stop right there. Joseph wouldn't fit in with many people in society today now, would he? <laughs> he showed a cheerful spirit even in the prison, and his manly face soon attracted the attention of the prison keeper. Day after day, the keeper watched him, and finally he decided that Joseph was the very one he needed to help care for the other prisoners. After a while, he go gave Joseph full charge of all the prisoners, and doubtless Joseph was once more as busy as he ever had been in Potiphar's house. It was about that time that Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, became much displeased with two of his special servants, the chief butler, who served him with wines, and the chief baker, who served him with bread. Now, because of his displeasure, he put both of them into prison, and Joseph cared for them there. 
One morning, Joseph found these men looking unusually sad. Why are you so troubled, he asked. And they replied, we have had strange dreams, and there is no one here to tell us the meaning of them. In the king's court, there are wise men who often tell the meaning of dreams, but we cannot send for them to come to us in prison. Surely God knows the meaning of your dreams, Joseph told them, and I am his servant. Tell me, therefore, what you have dreamed. He may reveal to me the true meaning. The chief butler was first to tell his dream. I saw a grapevine with three branches, he said. And while I looked upon it, the buds shot forth and became blossoms, and the blossoms became clusters of grapes. Then I squeezed the juice of the grapes into Pharaoh's cup, which I held in my hand. This I gave to the king, as I used to do when I stood by his table. Now God made Joseph to know the meaning of the dream, and Joseph said, The three branches that you saw are three days. After that time, you will be restored to your former position in the king's palace. But I beg you to remember me when it shall be well with you again, and make mention of me to Pharaoh. For I have been stolen from my father's house, and sold a captive among these people. And for no wrongdoing of mine, I have been thrust into this prison. The chief baker now told what his dream had been, and wished Joseph to tell him its meaning. There were three baskets upon my head, he said, and in the topmost one there were baked meats for the king's table. While I held them, the birds flew down and ate the contents of the topmost basket. Through the wisdom of God, Joseph knew the meaning of this dream, too. He felt sorry to tell its meaning, though, because he knew that his words would bring more grief to the chief baker's heart. But the chief baker expected him to tell, so he said, In your dream... The three baskets mean three days, and at that time the king will take you from the prison and hang your body upon a tree, and the birds will eat your flesh. Three days later, Pharaoh held a great feast for his servants in honor of his birthday. During the feast, he removed both the chief butler and the chief baker from the prison and disposed of them just as Joseph had said he would. But the chief butler soon forgot about Joseph, and two years passed by before he remembered to speak to the king about the one who had been so kind to him while he was in prison. All right, guys, we've got a picture here of Pharaoh making Joseph governor of Egypt, which is the next story we're going to be reading. All right, Joseph, a ruler in Egypt. This is our third story today, guys. Again, thank you so much for letting me share with you. This is pulled exclusively from Genesis chapter 41. <clears throat> One morning, Pharaoh awakened from sleep, wondering about the meaning of two strange dreams that he had dreamed during the night. He called the wise men of Egypt to tell him what the dreams meant, but they could not. Then he felt greatly troubled. When the chief butler heard about the king's distress, he thought at once of his own experiences when he was in prison. And all of a sudden, he remembered Joseph's kindness. How long he had forgotten that noble young man. Now he told Pharaoh about Joseph, and immediately the king sent for him. Joseph was busy caring for the prisoners and thinking perhaps that the chief butler had forever forgotten him when the messenger came from the king's palace. Pharaoh wishes to see you. Come at once, the messenger said. Joseph shaved his face and changed his prison clothes for clean, fresh garments. Then he hurried to the royal palace, wondering as he went why Pharaoh had sent for him. If only he would grant me liberty, he thought, how, how happy I should be. At the palace, Pharaoh was anxiously waiting to see him. Others, too, were waiting, and all were feeling deeply troubled. If this strange young man cannot help, what shall we do, they were wondering. Then there came a sound of footsteps outside the door, and Joseph was brought into their midst. Fair-skinned and handsome, he had once attracted the attention of all, and they thought, here indeed is someone different from us, and perhaps he can help. It was then that Pharaoh spoke. I have heard of you, he said, that you can tell the true meaning of dreams, and I have dreamed two dreams which trouble me greatly. Therefore I have sent for you, because none of the wise men of Egypt can even tell me what these dreams mean. Joseph replied, This wisdom does not belong to me. 
but rather to the God whom I serve. Tell me what your dreams were, and he will give me the meaning of them. And Pharaoh answered, In my dream I was standing by the river Nile, and presently I saw seven fat cattle come up out of the river and feed in the green meadow. Later I saw seven other cattle come up out of the river and stand upon the bank. These seven were very lean, and I saw them approach the seven fat cattle and eat them up. Still, they were as thin as they had been at the first, and then I awoke. Afterwards, I fell asleep and dreamed again and saw seven ears of corn grow up out of a stalk. Full, good ears they were. And while I was looking at them, seven other ears sprang up after them, withered, thin, and blasted by the east wind. These thin ears devoured the good ones, and once more, I awoke. Your dreams are indeed wonderful, Joseph told the king, and both of them have the same meaning. By them, God is making known to you what he is about to do. The seven fat cattle are seven years, and so also are the seven good full ears of corn. And in like manner, the seven lean cattle and the seven thin withered ears are seven years, which shall follow the first seven. God is making known to you by these dreams that there shall be seven years of, of plenty throughout all the land of Egypt. And alas, though, afterwards there shall be seven years of famine. These years of famine shall be so severe that the seven years of plenty shall be forgotten and everything shall be eaten up throughout the land. God has given you these two dreams to show you that these things will surely come to pass soon. He has warned you in this manner to prepare for the time of famine, lest it come upon you and destroy every living creature in your kingdom. It will be well for you to appoint a wise man to look after the food supply. Let him, during the seven plentiful years, lay aside enough each year to make sure of enough for all your people during the years when nothing shall grow. Pharaoh and the attendants who stood near his throne listened attentively to Joseph's words. And when he had finished speaking, the king said, Surely the Spirit of God is in this man and in his words, and they are good. Can we find another who could more wisely manage the affairs of this kingdom than he? And so it came about that Pharaoh made Joseph ruler over all the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh clothed Joseph in royal robes and placed a gold chain about his neck. He then took his signet ring from off his hand and placed it upon Joseph's and said, You shall be overseer of my house and your word shall govern my people in all the land of Egypt. Only in the throne will I be greater than you. And Pharaoh gave Joseph the second chariot that he had. In this Joseph rode through the streets of the city, and the people bowed themselves before him. Pharaoh called Joseph Zaphnapanahia, which means the man to whom secrets are revealed. He also gave Joseph an Egyptian princess to have as his wife. Now all this prosperity did not change the heart of Joseph, for he remained kind and just to all. Day after day he rode through the land and gathered up the food which grew everywhere in such abundance. This excess food he stored into buildings for future needs, until finally he had an enormous quantity laid aside for the years of famine. During this time God blessed Joseph with two sons whom he named Manasseh and Ephraim. And Joseph was grateful to God for all his blessings. He realized that all his troubles had brought about the great honor that he now enjoyed. When the seven years of plenty had passed by, the years of trouble began. Nowhere in all the land of Egypt would the fields yield any growth, and people began to have need of food. It was then that they came to Joseph, and it was then that he opened the storehouses, which had been filled during the years of plenty and sold food to the Egyptians. Not only in Egypt did the terrible famine rage, but also in the countries round about. From far and near, people came to Joseph, imploring him to sell corn or grain to them, lest they should die of hunger. All right, guys. Hey, thank y'all so much for letting me share another video with you guys. Um, God is so amazing, am I right? Um, if you're not already subscribed, I'd love to have you subscribe to the channel. Hit the bell. 
You'll get notified every time I drop a new video, which is multiple times a week. Plus, I also drop a brand new YouTube short with a Bible verse or something of the like every single morning at 8 o'clock um, New Mexico time, which is mountain time here in the U.S. I'd love to know what time that is, where you're at. I'd love to know where you're at. Where is where is God bringing this video to you at, all right? Also, if you have any questions, comments, suggestions, video ideas, let me know in the comments. If you guys have a prayer request, let me know in the comments. If you have a story about what happened at the foot of the cross, and if you're saved, you do, tell that story. What was life like before? What happened to push you to the foot of the cross? What happened at the foot of the cross? What has happened since then? What do you think God's taking you to in the future, all right? Let me know. Let's talk it up for God, guys. We, we talk about so much blah, blah, blah stuff in the world, but how often do we take the time to really talk about what's important in our lives? And I don't know about you, but there's nothing more important in my life than my relationship with God. Um, I love you all so much. Father God loves you even more. Do me a favor. Go out there. Have a blessed day. Tell somebody you see just how much Jesus loves them. It's really worth talking about, guys. And I'll see you in the next one.